As Dayan said, my name is Jeffrey Labovitz. I'm IOM's Director for Operations and Emergencies, and I'll be moderating today's session. Each of the panelists will have around 10 minutes to present ideas and experiences, and then I'll open the floor for questions and comments. I'll briefly give you some context on why we felt this topic was important one in, to include in this year's IDM. We work to provide humanitarian aid in crises settings around the world, which is complex at the best of times. The travel restrictions and disease prevention controls around COVID-19 have made things even more complicated than usual. At any given time, IOM on behalf of the UN system looking to coordinate camp coordination and camp management as a co-lead with UNHCR is looking at over 2000 camp-like situations. So we had a lot of concerns during this period of time. On top of this, many, in many countries, the challenges faced by, by migrants and IDPs merited special attention. We've all been forced to adjust and make changes to our usual ways of getting things done. 18 months into the pandemic, it seems like a good time to take stock and to see what has been working and what could have worked better. We're hoping this panel will allow for sharing of experiences on what it's been like to work during COVID-19 in countries that already have more than their fair share of challenges. Some of the areas we are looking at today include how COVID-19 has changed the way we provide humanitarian aid in crisis settings, ways that migrants and IDPs have become more vulnerable over the past year, how data is changing the ways we're, is changing and the ways we're using it in humanitarian settings. And finally, we'll look at innovative adjustments that are being made to deliver aid. We have four speakers today. We have uh, Mr. Diego Beltran, Director General Special Envoy for the Regional Response to the Venezuela Situation. We have Ms. Seda Gunte, Deputy Program Coordinator for the Migration and Services Department in the Turkish Red Crescent. Mr. Christian Mulamba, who's working as the Central African Republic Country Director for IMC, International Medical Corps. And of course, we have our keynote speaker, Secretary Mohamed Mohsin, Ministry of Disaster Management and Relief from Bangladesh. With more than 5.6 million refugees and migrants having left Venezuela as a result of um, socioeconomic instability and some turmoil and the ongoing humanitarian crisis, we have a special situation in the Americas, all in the time of COVID. Diego Beltran, in his current role as Special Envoy, you have been on the front lines of navigating how to deliver humanitarian assistance in the middle of COVID restrictions. You've been one of the advocates for those millions of people moving around the region when there was also a shutdown of borders. Diego, can you share your thoughts on how COVID-19 has impacted the provision of humanitarian assistance for Venezuelans who have left the country? And do you have suggestions on how the international crisis response can adapt to this new reality? Over to you, Diego. Thank you very much, uh, Chef. It's uh, good afternoon, uh, morning in my location. It's uh, really I'm very pleased uh, and honored to participate in this panel and with uh, distinguished speakers. And, and, and thank you for your kind uh, words of presentation. Uh, if you don't mind, I, I will switch to Spanish for my presentation. Uh, and we try to address your questions, and uh, but also provide some context uh, to understand better in which uh, way the the, uh, the humanitarian assistance uh, should have been provided in a situation that uh, it's uh, continue now 
Uh, and well, I will try now to put the presentation. Uh, let me see if possible to share the presentation. Yes, I think that we are now. It's all clear. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, the, the part of the context of the situation was that, uh, and I switched to Spanish now, uh, que desde el do, año 2017, uh, 2018, han ido creciendo, fueron creciendo los flujos mixtos de desplazamiento de eh, personas venezolanas desde su país. Alrededor de eh, más de cuatro millones uh, de venezolanos y venezolanas habían salido del país y se encontraban en 17 países de Latinoamérica y el Caribe. Antes que empezara el COVID, estamos hablando alrededor en primer, primeros meses del año 2020. Eh, los países que han acogido más venezolanos, naturalmente Colombia, que tiene una frontera muy extensa, uh, Perú con también un millón de personas, Chile, Ecuador, Brasil, y también eh, importante presencia, me, números menores, pero importante presencia en el Caribe y en Centroamérica y en eh, el cono sur. En las rutas más usadas, y esto continúa siendo cierto, pero uh, con eh, la variedad de que por el cierre de fronteras eh, la mayoría de los cruces son por pasos irregulares. Entonces, se pueden ver en el mapa la más dinámica de las vías de, de, del corredor andino, como es conocido, que atraviesa Colombia, Ecuador, Perú, Bolivia, Chile, llegando incluso al, al cono sur. Uh, rutas eh, Brasil, directas a través de Panamá, eh, también zonas fronteriza con Venezuela, en el Caribe básicamente rutas marítimas con grupos importantes de venezolanos que han llegado a Aruba, Curazao, Tobago, Guyana, y un, una ruta que en este momento es muy mencionada en los medios y en las discusiones, que es el Darién, eh, la ruta del Darién en, en Panamá, que tiene eh, condiciones específicas de tránsito a través de zonas selváticas. Para responder a esta situación, el secretario general de Naciones Unidas, el secretario general Antonio Guterres, nominó a la OIM y a la ACNUR, le pidió a la OIM y a la ACNUR que coliberaran eh, esta respuesta. Y fue en, ese, en esa respuesta que eh, OIM y ACNUR, en una decisión conjunta y en crear un mecanismo innovador que ha sido una, y es una plataforma de coordinación que está basada en Panamá y cubre los 17 países que reciben personas venezolanas. Eh, eh, alrededor de esta plataforma coordinan 159 organizaciones, organizaciones de Naciones Unidas, ONGs en un 90%. Y también un representante especial conjunto fue nominado, fue nombrado, el señor Eduardo Stein, ex vicepresidente de Guatemala. Eh, se creó una estructura con nueve sectores, plataformas nacionales en ocho países, plataformas subnacionales, y eh, ustedes pueden ver en la pantalla los distintos sectores de respuesta que son los que normalmente se tienen en una emergencia de este tipo. Como Chef mencionaba, el director general honró nominándome como enviado especial y establecimos una oficina específicamente en Panamá para dar seguimiento a esta situación, a esta emergencia. Ustedes pueden ver en pantalla algunos de los roles que esta oficina eh, de la OIM en Panamá eh, tiene. Esto eh, era ya una circunstancia difícil, con un grado de vulnerabilidad muy alto de eh, los venezolanos y venezolanas. Pero el impacto del COVID ha sido devastador ha multiplicado las vulnerabilidades, ha creado situaciones mucho más problemáticas. Como sucedió en la mayor parte del mundo, eh, en pocas horas las fronteras de los países se fueron cerrando. Eh, sin mayor coordinación entre, entre las distintas medidas, pero coincidiendo en cierres totales o parciales de las fronteras. Esto produjo inmediatamente que la población venezolana que se encontraba 
los refugiados inmigrantes que se encontraban en los países y que en su mayoría trabajaban en la economía, en el sector informal, fueran eh, perdiendo toda forma de empleo, toda forma de ingreso. Fueron desalojados de sus casas, perdieron cualquier posibilidad de acceso a educación, a salud, sin posibilidad de adaptarse a las nuevas normas de distanciamiento social y a las necesidades de la cuarentena. Y en, en, en una situación muy particular, ya que seguía habiendo ingresos a los países receptores, así como personas que retornaban a Venezuela, pero la mayoría de estos por vías irregulares, por toches, por caminos irregulares, poniéndolos en un gran, uh, en un gran riesgo de eh, ser víctimas de trata, víctimas de tráfico, y eh, mencionaría como un factor que comenzó a crecer muy, muy difícil, que hizo las cosas más complicadas, el, eh, las manifestaciones de xenofobia y de discriminación hacia los migrantes y los refugiados. En esta pantalla pueden ver algunos datos de distintos estudios, ustedes los pueden leer, yo no, no voy a repetir, pero básicamente menciona porcentajes arriba del 80 y 90%, que perdieron su empleo, que fueron desalojados. Y eh, en un contexto en que el COVID, la COVID-19 fue avanzando en forma muy importante en Latinoamérica y el Caribe. En este momento se cuentan con eh, 5 millones de casos reportados, un millón y medio eh, muertes y... Eh, eh, y con muchos de los países que eh, han estado entre los principales países del mundo afectados por la COVID-19. En este momento la situación comienza a mejorar. Nueve de los 17 países han pasado hasta el 50% de vacunación. Sin embargo, no podemos uh, ignorar que la piramide del Caribe abarca el 20% de los casos de COVID en el mundo con especial afectación. En este, en este contexto, los países y sectores tomaron algunas acciones. No quedaron inmóviles, no fueron indiferentes a la situación de migrantes y refugiados. Muchos de ellos, por ejemplo, como Perú y Ecuador, eh, renovaron las visas, hicieron automáticas renovaciones de visas y suspendieron los periodos de caducidad de visas y de permisos para que no, tuvieran que, no, no fueran expulsados los migrantes y refugiados. Y eh, pienso que en esta sección ya empezamos con algunas Uh, no recomendaciones, sino acciones concretas que se desarrollaron en el marco de la pandemia. Eh, ahí se como Colombia y Argentina emitieron decretos para suspender los desalojos. Alg algunos países como Brasil desarrollaron un, un subsidio universal para sus nacionales, pero también incluyendo a migrantes y refugiados de todas las nacionalidades. Países como Perú, Argentina, Chile, incluyeron, dieron permisos temporales a venezolanos, médicos y profesionales de salud para participar en la respuesta del COVID. Y se eh, iniciaron algunos procesos de regularización. Mientras tanto, esta estructura que el sector general que había pedido a OIM y ACNUR estructura voluntaria que trabajara adaptó su respuesta a las necesidades del COVID entonces uh, el fortalecimiento de los programas de CBI Cash Based Initiatives eh, se transformó en uno de los mecanismos más importantes 
el apoyo a las organizaciones de la diáspora venezolana que ayudaban a dar, a, a, a apoyar la ayuda humanitaria y la contención de sus compatriotas. A la ayuda a eh, incrementar y ampliar las facilidades, la infraestructura de salud y a establecer centros centros para que los migrantes y refugiados pudieran cumplir con las cuarentenas y medidas sanitarias. Los países, eh, conjuntamente con el apoyo de IEM y ACNUR, eh, continuaron reuniéndose alrededor del proceso Quito, un proceso que tiene aproximadamente 14 países receptores. Y buscaron y buscan soluciones entre todos para poder eh, abordar los, los flujos masivos de venezolanas y venezolanos en el país. Actualmente eh, Brasil es el chair del uh, proceso Quito y se ha formado un grupo de amigos del proceso Quito para ayudar a los países receptores con la Unión Europea, el Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo y nueve países que ustedes ven. En el También se desarrolló eh, en el año 2020 con apoyo con el liderazgo de España y la Unión Europea y en el 2021 con el liderazgo de Canadá conferencias de donantes con gran participación de gobiernos y gran compromiso para continuar sensibilizando sobre la situación de los ciudadanos y realizar contribuciones para fortalecer la respuesta. Esto, estos, estos elementos que estoy mencionando, la conferencia de donantes, la conformación del grupo de amigos, Creemos que responden un poco a la pregunta que el del panel se hace sobre mecanismos de financiamiento alternativo, sobre mecanismos que puedan reforzar los recursos disponibles. Pero no habría o no habrá una solución sostenible si eh, los esfuerzos de regularización no continúan y se fortalecen. Actualmente eh, ha sido de público el proceso ambicioso y muy positivo dado por el gobierno de Colombia para establecer un proceso de, temporal de protección eh, que va a dar documentación por 10 años a venezolanos y venezolanas y que ya tiene más de un millón de personas registradas. Pero adicionalmente, eh, República Dominicana lleva a cabo un plan importante. Ecuador iniciará lo, el mismo. Perú está realizándolo. Bolivia comenzará un plan de regularización. Brasil y los países del Cono Sur normalmente están documentando. Entonces, para entrar en, en la parte final de, de mi intervención, de mis comentarios, eh, quisiera sintetizar algunos de estos puntos que estoy presentando como respuestas y recomendaciones a, a lo que fue una pandemia intensada. Como se mencionó en el panel anterior, que nadie estaba preparado para eh, poder afrontarla. En, en ese sentido, la inclusión de los migrantes y refugiados en los planes nacionales de atención, de asistencia. Eh, esto ya fue hecho por algunos países y es una línea importante de trabajo para poder contener, esta, contener las vulnerabilidades que tienen los migrantes y refugiados. La, la inclusión de los migrantes y refugiados en los planes nacionales de vacunación. 
no con prioridad frente a los nacionales, sino con los mismos criterios que se aplican para la población nacional. La eh, homogeneización de la regularización de los procedimientos de los países. Como mencionaba David Codur en el panel anterior, eh, mayor compartir la necesidad y compartir las best practices, las buenas prácticas. El trabajo eh, con eh, provisión de cash, de efectivo, eh, las alternativas que permitan trabajar, dar asistencia remotamente a los refugiados migrantes. Y para eh, ir finalizando, un foco muy importante, una prioridad a la prevención de la trata y el tráfico, eh, que naturalmente por el cierre de las fronteras han aumentado. Y lo que ha sido general en todo el mundo, uno de los efectos perversos de la pandemia, el incremento de la violencia intrafamiliar y la violencia basada en género. la distribución, la, el aumento de mecanismos virtuales para que los niños migrantes y refugiados puedan hacer una educación a través de bicicletas y otros mecanismos. La creación de más centros de recepción en fronteras, el fortalecimiento de los existentes. Y por último, y, y no menos importante, el fortalecimiento de la cooperación entre los gobiernos receptores de migrantes y refugiados y la comunidad internacional. Eh, dejaría aquí la presentación, espero no haberme extendido mucho y bueno, muy agradecido por la invitación disponible para responder preguntas si fuera necesario. Muchísimas gracias. Diego, thank you so much for that presentation. And it was wonderful to get kickstarted by you, who's been such a great advocate. But there's also, um, it was nice to start with this example, as there were some consequences of COVID, which were, which were not easy. Of course, um, borders closed, mobility was hampered. We heard that 80% of uh, the people lost their jobs. So this is their ways of making ends meet. So that's really, really difficult. There were issues such as gender-based violence, and increase in xenophobia. But, but the real lesson learned is in identifying all those problems is a coming together of, the, of all the host countries. And what that meant was there was a need to adapt and adapting and hosting 5.6 million people. And when we're looking at those numbers globally, that's a really substantive amount of individuals who suddenly have lost their jobs, who are perceived sometimes as vectors of Uh, what is a global pandemic. But what we saw was that through the Quito process, through bilateral agreements, was that um, there was an extension of visas and residency permits. Um, there was a suspension of evictions. There was subsidies which were provided, which included the inclusion of migrants and refugees. And then we, and then we of course, talked about the regularization programming and inclusion of migrants and refugees into vaccination processes. Those are a lot of lessons learned summarized in a very short period of time. Uh, thank you for your work on this, Diego, and I'm sure we'll have some good questions and comments. I also want to um, thank UNHCR, who's the co-host of our coordination mechanism, in that coming together, I think we did better in working with all of you. Let's now shift the perspective of migrants and IDPs and hear from Mr. Christian Mulamba. Mr. Malamba, Dr. Malamba has been with IMC since 2006 as country director. He oversees emergency medical services. So this is really key. Healthcare training and development programs. He was also involved in IMC's post Ebola response in West Africa. Christian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's a pleasure and honor to me, for me to be here today and uh, share Central African experience on uh, responding to COVID crisis while hosting also uh, a complex emergency crisis. Uh, Central Africa, for those who might not know it, 
is going through a political and security crisis since 2013. And uh, the crisis was exacerbated a year ago when the country came close to the presidential election. But while dealing with uh, that crisis and uh, estimate 670,000 IDPs in country scattered in over 70 IDP sites, the country had to face as well the COVID pandemic. And uh, Central Africa is one of the country where resources are extremely scarce and the infrastructure very limited or missing. On top of that, adding the COVID complexity to support over 600,000 IDPs was a very serious challenge. But quickly, how did we manage to cope with uh, the COVID crisis? Uh, first, for the international humanitarian community, we were first as well perceived as a uh, migrant ourselves. And it was very critical from the beginning to be very careful the way we manage as the stigmatization of anyone who was perceived to be moving from a COVID um, affected country to Central Africa was key to the acceptance of the humanitarian while trying to assist the community. The country was very uh, reluctant to open its border to anyone coming from anywhere where COVID was mentioned. Therefore, for humanitarian, it was a key um, to success, to be very careful and respecting carefully the social distancing and the quarantine. We work with the government through the Ministry of Health to determine rules for uh, people coming in and going out. And as as first responder, we were aligned 100% to those rules to ensure that we have the community acceptance and ensure that humanitarian are not the vector of the COVID-19 in a country that was, uh, we have to say, very spare from the beginning of the COVID pandemic. So as that, we were severely affected and limited in our mobility, therefore limited in our capacity to provide uh, our services in full capacity as we were working before the COVID pandemic era. Once adopted those principles and accepted, we start moving progressively with uh, the government in how to respond to the COVID pandemic. As elsewhere, main major cities were the one affected. In Sierra was Bangui mainly, the capital city that was affected with most of the cases, but progressively we see the disease spreading into districts where um, services, healthcare services are very scarce or sometimes missing. And in that context, we had to quickly find solution of how to ensure the disease don't spread further as those districts in rural area are the one hosting most of the internal, internal displaced uh, people, settlements or camps. And then um, given the uh, uncertainty of how to control a COVID pandemic uh, in a community, it was very key for us to ensure those IDP camps and settings are well protected from the pandemic. Therefore, prevention measures have to be initiated quickly and earlier. The disease will be spreading in the country. Now we're doing such as having available, protecting uh, first responders, healthcare workers, humanitarian, and as well, uh, key stakeholder in the community, and at some extent, providing individual masks to everyone in the IDP settings. That was a very challenging because the country itself, from the capital city, at their major health facilities, key resources for COVID protection and prevention were missing. Uh, where to find them when the country itself was lacking a central pharmaceutic system that could make available all those supplies. And as we have observed elsewhere in the world, only few places could produce the supplies. Now, in an environment where movement of people and good is restricted, how were we going to get those supplies in time, distribute and work highly on prevention to avoid and minimize the spread of the disease? 
Then came uh, the very positive things we have seen here was the humanitarian intelligence joining force together to create platforms. One of the platform was the preposition stockpile set up at WHO where people could get access to some of the key supplies such as masks and the PPEs, placing order and then working on how we organize around all the humanitarian actors per country, per region, placing order in time and expecting to receive them. That was one, so the platform. The second successful initiative was uh, the WFP air services, which allow mobility of the first responder, but also mobility of some goods and cargo that were key to responding to uh, the COVID pandemic. The third initiative was global with New York, Ocha, of scaling up quickly uh, was an experimental one because it has to move to a non-classical way of uh, receiving and responding using surf funding. IOM hosted the, the grant for health uh, actors and work with those uh, respective NGOs to scale up the response. While working on scaling up the response, the country moved into a more deeper crisis with armed groups intensifying the, the, the resistance or rebellion against the country. And it was not easy to get access to do the work that was to be done to put in place uh, infrastructure that could provide uh, isolation of uh, COVID positive patients, provide, uh, get all the equipment to equip all the districts that were going from some of them from zero equipment to some level of equipment where we could provide COVID treatments for critical patients. And in all this also organized of CAR to Accra or Nairobi, the Medevac capability. But all this, although it was uh, for country like CAR where resources are often limited, managing to put all those things in place during the pandemic in such short period of time it was a very successful initiative. And for us, it was an example that when the global community joined force together, we can really tackle bigger challenges. And then masks were available, full PPE for first responders were available and some infrastructure were put in place with a strong level of IPC that could provide safety and security to healthcare workers, but also uh, providing patient treatment in dignity and um, we all celebrated that. Now, one of the thing I will always say, and it's always challenging to ensure that here I will speak most precisely about the IDPs, the internal displaced people, how to ensure they also are considered in a country priority when deciding on critical things. We did not see the IDP coming among the first people to consider when planning for the general population or the critical population. And for me here, it's a call for global convention or alliance on the internal displaced person. How can we reinforce uh, rules and law of any convention we can bring together as an international community for providing better protection and restoring some dignity to the internal displaced people. Over. Christian, thank you very much for that interesting presentation. Um, you know, going deep into Central African Republic and being able to deliver PPE during a pandemic when delivery mechanisms are not in place, when none of us are really prepared, where there is a disparity of um, distribution is not the easiest of assignments to have. I think you talked about um, concern about even humanitarian actors being vectors of the disease and needing to ensure and make sure there's protocols put in place to ease communities and the need for community acceptance. And that's something which is um, seminal. You talked about uh, WHO supplies of PPE, WFP air uh, qualities and surf funding. For those who are not aware, 
The SURF doesn't usually give funds to NGOs, but in the, in the context of um, COVID, it was clear that there had to be an NGO response. So they set up a special facility to reach NGOs and IMC was one of those beneficiaries. And I think that was one of those best practices. I think we have lots of lessons learned associated with it reaching um, you know, quickly and effectively a lot of different communities on uh, making sure that IDPs are incorporated into national structures. That's certainly the best practice. And thank you for your work on this um, very difficult and important uh, time. Um, so we, we just heard the two examples from the Americas and Africa to show the need to continue rising to the challenge and continuing to do better. There's um, a couple of ways to make sure that we are always improving. And one is through the use of timely and up-to-date data. Here to talk about data and coordination is Ms. Zeta Guntai. Ms. Guntai works in Turkey, a country currently hosting 3.9 million migrants and refugees, over 90% which are Syrian. So there's a considerable, considerable challenges already. Ms. Guntai, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me well? I hear you perfect, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the opening sentence. Yes, Turkey hosts the largest population of the migrants, especially Syrian migrants. Uh, so uh, data is always at the heart of our uh, humanitarian aid interventions. Uh, but for us, of course, to be with these big uh, target population, uh, data is always important uh, for us. COVID-19 changes, uh, let me say, everything uh, in terms of collecting data, sharing data between stakeholders. Uh, but before uh, going deeper on this, uh, I, I would like to mention a bit about TRCS and our efforts in uh, migration services. Uh, then how we convert our interventions and data collection analysis methodologies uh, in line with the COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, as you may already uh, know that uh, we are conducting the largest cash program in, uh, in the world, uh, ESSN, uh, Emergency Security Network, Social Security Network, uh, and we have community centers uh, in uh, the largest population provinces, uh, migrant provinces in Turkey. Uh, and also we have child, pro uh, child programs directly serving to the uh, migrant children. So uh, we have a huge uh, target population uh, and we serve uh, in different sectors from protection to psychosocial support, health, socioeconomic empowerment, uh, and also social cohesion uh, programs. Uh, so uh, our motto is uh, one touch thousand lives, uh, really we, we touch over uh, 3 million uh, migrants and refugees through our programs and uh, efforts, activities. Also uh, TRCS has uh, 300 branches in the field. Uh, so we can say that uh, we are the largest NGO uh, with a huge uh, field presence, uh, which makes us easier to reach out to target groups to uh, provide them the uh, needed services. Uh, but before that, we have to understand the changing needs, changing context, and uh, to, to plan our interventions. And we have to monitor up-to-date data uh, in terms of the impact at uh, impact and the uh, new uh, vulnerabilities occurred uh, in line with uh, COVID-19. Uh, we were lucky that uh, we have been already started investing invested in uh, digitalization through TRCS. Five, year, five years ago, we started a, a digital transformation um, effort and uh, we were mostly ready such a crisis, <laughs> such a uh, inter online interventions, because we had uh, already IT systems, uh, IT applications that we can use, uh, we can uh, continue our operations online. Uh, but the fact that uh, before COVID, uh, this wa uh, these was uh, not our first preference to reach out our 
uh, target communities. But with the COVID, uh, the need was uh, at the field. Uh, I would like to also say that uh, we were the only NGO working in the field during the lockdowns and the restriction uh, during the COVID. So we were in the field, uh, but the target communities uh, cannot reach us uh, in our community centers or branches. We want them, but our capacity is not uh, enough. No capacity can be enough to reach out all those uh, vulnerable groups uh, in the field during the COVID restrictions. So uh, like every other uh, stakeholders, we convert our efforts uh, on remote practices. Um, as I said, we were lucky we had all these uh, technological tools to uh, reach our target co uh, communities and also uh, continue our operations between our colleagues and partners. Uh, but the problem is the target communities has not uh, enough capability, capacity or access uh, to reach us uh, through uh, remote and online uh, interventions and they don't have devices or uh, inter enough internet packages. Uh, so that was the biggest uh, problem that we faced. Uh, then we started to uh, develop cooperations with the municipalities, mobile phone and technology companies. Uh, we started advocacy uh, to for them to have uh, these opportunities because in in this uh, today's world, we can say that uh, having no internet or uh, appropriate devices uh, to rem remote uh, operations, uh, this causes new vulnerabilities. For example, in the restrictions times, all education was moved to uh, online education, and we identified through our needs assessments that 75% uh, of migrants, especially the Syrian uh, refugee children, uh, cannot access to the online uh, education. This is not only uh, about the uh, devices or lack of uh, internet uh, opportunities, but also uh, the uh, knowledge, the capacity that to use them uh, is really very low. So we started a huge uh, training uh, effort uh, to uh, make them uh, to use these the, uh, to these online opportunities. Uh, and also, uh, as I mentioned, we started uh, cooperations with uh, mobile phone uh, companies and municipalities uh, for the vulnerable groups uh, to have proper internet or devices. Uh, we have some. We had some uh, agreements with the private sector to uh, provide uh, these devices, iPads, lap laptops, to the uh, vulnerable groups. But still, uh, I can say that there is a long way to go to reach out the most vulnerable. Uh, so the conventional methodology is to reach out them and to collect data from uh, to, for needs assessment or for the uh, interactions. Uh, we need to continue the convention, conventional uh, methodology. So we use face-to-face -face, uh, data collection still. Uh, but uh, we strengthened, we had already had the community-based uh, interventions, but uh, for the data collection, community-based interventions, which means, uh, for example, we developed a, an advisory committees and uh, advisory boards and special topic, focusing on special topics, and also the communities, like women communities, youth communities, uh, they also focusing on the special topics and vulnerabilities. So it would, uh, it makes it uh, easier to reach out the most vulnerable through the communities. Uh, I haven't mentioned, but uh, we all uh, humanitarian aid act actors started uh, online, um, needs assessments, uh, crowd messaging, SMS, WhatsApps, uh, as we are now using uh, FGDs through Zooms, uh, Zoom uh, or uh, some other applications. Uh, but still, as I said, the most vulnerable are still vulnerable and vulnerable more than ever uh, that they cannot, uh, they don't have these opportunity to reach us. 
Uh, and also I would like to mention about the sharing data. Uh, secondary data analysis uh, was important uh, before the COVID, but became more important uh, during the COVID period uh, because, because like us, there are uh, many NGOs in the field, not during the restrictions, but during the restrictions, they uh, continue their interventions online and collect data online. Uh, so sharing this uh, data uh, and uh, providing accessible uh, data, uh, public data uh, became much more important uh, during the COVID. Uh, but of course, the main concern uh, and main uh, concentration was on uh, general data protection rules and uh, data privacy. Uh, by um, securing the data pr privacy, it is important to share uh, those data in a proper way among uh, humanitarian aid partners. Uh, we, I think uh, all stakeholders understood it uh, very well during the uh, pandemics uh, to reach out the uh, target groups. Uh, as I mentioned, we were lucky uh, that we had already uh, served, served to uh, around uh, 2 million uh, refugees with our services. So we had a huge database that we can, uh, we can analyze the trends uh, live trends and uh, we can put uh, new data, the uh, other stakeholders data and field data in this database and we are still investing in uh, Power BI, uh, some uh, analyzing tool, advanced analyzing tools, uh, so it helps us uh, very much to uh, identify the uh, changing needs immediately. Uh, and uh, we conduct regular uh, online uh, needs assessments in the field uh, together with the conventional methodologies face to face we go directly the, to the target groups and also uh, the community based data collection modality uh, was one of our uh, priority uh, that we put in our system that we can put in our system uh, and also as an uh, improvement point, uh, I think it is obvious that uh, we will be investing, all humanitarian actors will be investing in the digitalization and uh, big data analysis much more in the upcoming periods. Uh, but it is also important that to col collaborate and cooperate on this. Uh, with the rules of uh, data privacy, of course, uh, but we have to share more our data uh, between ourselves to understand uh, what is coming or uh, uh, what's going on in the field. Uh, this is uh, my first intentions about uh, data privacy. I hope I couldn't miss any question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Seda. It's really interesting that you had gone through this digital transformation type of initiative prior to go to COVID, which probably put you in a better position in addressing needs during COVID times. Uh, you were able to um, conduct um, assessment through IT and information technology. You had agreements with mobile phone operators. I understand that there is um, a great need to look at data security, and that's a lesson learned from that whole process. It's something which we are acutely aware about, aware about in terms of data in general. Um, it was also, we understood that there were the vulnerable, some of the most poor didn't have access to the internet, it didn't have, have access to devices, and so there were programs put in place to address those issues, but there was still the need to come together in person during those times. Thank you very much for your intervention. Now we'll be moving the discussion over to Bangladesh. As we know, the government of Bangladesh has generously hosted and provided to some excuse me, 884,000 Rohingya. All of our presenters are hosting huge amounts of migrant and refugee populations <clears throat> who resided 34 congested camps formally designated by the government of Bangladesh. So this is a great concern when you have congestion and a lot of people and COVID. 
More than half the displaced are women and children requiring special attentions. Uh, months before the onset of COVID, the government of Bangladesh and humanitarian partners in Cox's Bazar acted on all fronts to prepare for and respond to the outbreak in very complex settings and in many ways were successful in limiting the impact of the pandemic. Secretary Bosin serves as the Joint Secretary of Bangladesh's Ministry of Disaster Management and Relief. He's been, he has a distinguished 30 year career. I was happy to be able to meet him not so long ago. And he's been one of um, the leaders at the forefront of these efforts. Honorable Secretary, the floor is yours. I think you may still be on mute. Yes. Thank you, Ziff. Uh, respected uh, panelists and excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, greetings from Bangladesh. Uh, at the very outset, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me in such an auspicious event. It is my great pleasure to be here. And I want to mention a few uh, words regarding the situation of our country. Due to climate-induced and seismic hazard, Bangladesh is one of the well-known as one of the most disaster-prone countries in the world. The country is densely populated with a total population of 165 million, where 1,100 people live per square kilometer. This is the situation of our country. And according to global, uh, German was global climate risk in this 2021, Bangladesh is ranked as the seventh most affected country by extreme weather events between 2000 to 2019. The report of the International Internal Displaced Monitoring Unit, IDMC, is May 2021, pointed out the global uh, 30.7 million displacements occurred from disasters in 2020. Among them, Bangladesh was reported as the third most affected countries as disaster triggered. The COVID-19 pandemic also particularly affect the vulnerable people. And uh, regarding the crisis response of COVID-19, the government has been trying to keep a balance between life and livelihood. I want to mention again the life and livelihood in the context of the resources and institutional realities of Bangladesh. And also, I want to mention that we have formulated a national strategy on the management of disaster climate induced internal displacement uh, last year. We have developed a contingency plan for COVID-19 in March 20. The contingency plan covers the preparedness, response, and recovery for the most vulnerable people during the pandemic situation. And following the contingency plan, government provided a large scale humanitarian and food support to 20 million affected families. It means it covers uh, 70 million people you know, in our country. We supported with cash and stimulus packages for jobless people to save their livelihoods. The support is continuing with its scales to cover more than more and reduce their vulnerabilities. And by this time, 20 million people have been vaccinated to contain the spread of COVID-19. And during the pandemic situation, number of volunteers worked very effectively for vaccination activities and support many affected people. We can say that it is one of the key stands for the success of crisis response uh, during the pandemic. And if I mention uh, regarding the Rohingya people, 
you know, this is the fifth year since forcibly displaced Myanmar nationals have fled from Rakhine state of Myanmar amid the allegations of army abuse, murder, rape, and killing, and entered Bangladesh seeking safety and shelters. As an immediate neighbor, Bangladesh responded to the call of humanity and provided them with food, shelters, and protection. This courageous and timely gesture of Honorable Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina, not only stabilized the regional region from a catastrophe, it generated unprecedented solidarity in the international community as well. The government has planned shifting uh, up to 0.1 million uh, FDMNs, it means the forcibly displaced Myanmar nationals to another place called the Bhashan Chor. And we have arranged large scale livelihood programs like fish cultivation, you know, sewing, training, etc. And with the help of NGOs, we are setting another, you know, hospital even there. And then finally on 9th of October, 2021, we have signed MU with UNHCR for more intensive humanitarian support to forcibly displace Myanmar nationals at the island Bhashanchor. And I want to mention some situation, whatever we are facing, in Cox's Bazar, about 7,000 acre of reserve forest land have been already occupied for ensuring shelters of Rohingyas. The trees under social afforestation program, natural plants, flora and fauna were devastated in the Rohingya settlement areas. And you know, we have planted trees to restore the seriously devastated biodiversity of the camp area. And within four years, we have planted more than 1.5 million trees. And also, I want to mention that uh, Honorable Prime Minister of our country, Sheikh Hasina, once again said, just a few days back in the 76th UNGA session, that Rohingya crisis had been created by Myanmar and they have to solve it on their own. And Honorable Prime Minister also emphasized that whatever we have doing in Bangladesh is purely on a temporary basis and they even must go back to their country. And in the pandemic situation, uh, we have successfully controlled the COVID-19 transmission in the camp area. We have 35 camps. And you'll be happy to know that compared to our national average, the infection rate is quite lower in the camp area. And though we don't hope any death, but only 32, people, 32 FDMNs died of COVID-19 where most of them were senior citizens. An earlier COVID-19 vaccination campaign had been organized in uh, camp areas as well. And the government started the vaccination in the camp area. And the government of Bangladesh has ensured regular immunization to every newborn child under government financing and supervision. Government also conducted vitamin A capsule feeding campaign at present. Cholera vaccination campaign is going into the, uh, in the camp level. To ensure the safety and security round the clock, we have deployed the uh, law and enforcing agencies. And under the Collaboration with, you know, uh, with the 
learn uh, agencies and other uh, agencies working to establish safety, security, peace, and harmony in the camp. And I don't know whether you will be surprised to know that every year more than 30,000 new babies are born in the camp areas. To avoid the overcrowded camps in Cox's Bazar, the government has developed a land, it's called the Bhashan Chor, in order to provide proper safety security to them. We have already relocated 19,000 and hopefully next, within the next couple of days, we are going to shift another 80,000. There are some challenges. I don't want to mention the all challenges, but only one challenge is Myanmar showed no interest to scrutinize the data of the, of the FDMN's people. And despite the world's most densely populated camp, one of the largest camp settlement and disaster prone area, government of Bangladesh has successfully converted the camp into one of the most livable, livable camps in the world. Again, you know, I want to mention that the multidimensional endeavors of Bangladesh for reducing disaster risks protect, protected the development gains and reflected in 7.5% of the GDP growth in the last decade. And even the pandemic situation, the GDP was 5.24 in the last fiscal year. Furthermore, furthermore, our country has achieved the qualification and recommendation from UN for LDC graduation. will be hopefully graduate from LDC in 2026. Even then, in 2020, during uh, pandemic situation, we faced cyclone Ampan and five times monsoon floods that incurred huge damage and affected more than 6 million people amid the pandemic. The recent cyclone years in May 2021 also affect, affected the coastal areas of Bangladesh. And therefore, we will have to continue the effort towards, sust towards sustainable development through effective disaster risk reduction measures even in the pandemic situation. And taking this opportunity, I would like to echo the words for our uh, Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina during the 76th UN uh, General Assembly. She mentioned, we must ensure universal and affordable access to vaccine for people across the world. This vaccine inequality must be urgently addressed. We cannot chart out a sustainable recovery and be safe by leaving millions behind. And she also asked the global community, the pandemic has disproportionately impacted the climate vulnerable countries unless there is immediate measures that devastating impacts of climate change will be irreversible. We therefore call up the developed and industrial countries to cut emissions, compensate for the loss and damage and ensure adequate financing and technology for transfer, for adaptation and resilience building. I can say Bangladesh is progressing through a whole of society approach, even in the COVID-19 situation. I will expect working together until achieving full socioeconomic recovery and towards building a safer and resilient nation. With this, I would like to conclude my remarks. Thank you, stay safe, stay healthy, Thank you all again. Thank you, sir. And, and uh, I'd like to reinforce the message of the Honorable Prime Minister 
about vaccine access. And thank you so much for stressing that point. Certainly your work on disaster risk reduction. I mean, Bangladesh has a, a large population. It suffers from um, flooding every year. And, and you have done ample work. I've visited those sites um, to, to look at preparation to, in order to mitigate from disasters. That was certainly applied to the extent possible um, looking at different situations. I also saw in the camps that there were special activities associated with shielding, with, with education of people of what to do when they are ill. There was actually for host communities and the camps alike, there was even um, oxygen production facilities, which were put in place and dedicated medical facilities, all um, best practices and lessons learned associated with how we dealt with a very difficult situation. Um, with that, I would like to thank all of the panelists for their insightful presentations. They've highlighted the extreme challenges of responding to crises during a pandemic and the specific, vulner specific vulnerabilities of migrants and IDPs. My understanding is that we have four um, statements either from the floor or online, and we will start with Ecuador. Gracias, señor moderador. Um, siendo la primera vez que mi delegación toma la palabra en el diálogo internacional, deseo dar la bienvenida a tanto a la señora Daniels como a la señora Pope y desearles éxito en el cumplimiento de sus funciones. Igualmente, deseo agradecer a los panelistas por sus valiosas presentaciones. El Ecuador, fiel a su tradición de solidaridad y como país de acogida de un número importante y creciente de personas en situación de movilidad, respeta y promueve todos los derechos de los migrantes. Tanto el enviado especial de la OIM para la respuesta para Venezuela, a quien acabamos de escuchar, señor Diego Beltrán, como el representante especial Eduardo Stein, durante sus recientes visitas al Ecuador, observaron la eficacia de la normativa y políticas nacionales durante la pandemia, otorgando acceso a los servicios de salud pública a todos, independientemente de su nacionalidad o de su situación migratoria. Para superar los retos pendientes, en particular respecto a los migrantes en situación de vulnerabilidad, los esfuerzos del Ecuador durante la pandemia han sido integrales, a través de acciones como las siguientes. Uno, se suspendieron temporalmente los plazos en los procesos administrativos relacionados con la movilidad humana, incluida la renovación de visas, para evitar que las personas pierdan su condición migratoria. Dos, el proceso de regularización de ciudadanos venezolanos no se suspendió por la pandemia y contempló una extensión del plazo para que soliciten una visa humanitaria. 67 mil ciudadanos venezolanos fueron regularizados y forman parte de los 221 mil ciudadanos venezolanos en situación regular en el Ecuador. En diciembre de este año, iniciará el segundo proceso de regularización que beneficiará a 210 mil ciudadanos venezolanos adicionales. Esta iniciativa facilita la concesión de visas de residencia temporal y se complementará con una estrategia de inclusión socioeconómica para la creación de empleo, provisión de medios de vida y reconocimiento de estudios y títulos de extranjeros. Igualmente, contempla iniciativas para combatir la discriminación y la xenofobia. Cuarto, se ha incluido a migrantes y refugiados, independientemente de su situación migratoria, en el Plan Nacional de Vacunación contra el COVID-19, beneficiando igualmente también a personas en tránsito. Este exitoso plan de vacunación ha logrado inmunizar al 75% de la población mayor de 16 años. Señor moderador, para concluir, la crisis de salud global exige más que nunca diálogo, solidaridad y cooperación para gestionar las fronteras y la movilidad de forma idónea a fin de mantener las vías de migración regular al tiempo de reforzar la lucha contra las redes de trata y tráfico de personas. Ecuador reitera nuestra convicción de que el Pacto Mundial para una Migración Segura, Ordenada y Regular es la guía apropiada para encaminar nuestros esfuerzos especialmente en un contexto en que los países modifican sus regulaciones migratorias de manera rápida e impredecible. Muchas gracias. Thank you for your intervention.
and clarification of all the different actions that took place in Ecuador. Um, next from the floor, we have the United States. Dear IOM moderator and distinguished panelists, thank you very much for convening the second session of the 2021 International Dialogue on Migration. This time with a focus on the nexus of migration and the pandemic recovery, we are pleased to be part of this important discussion. The United States is deeply committed to defeating COVID-19 everywhere. We have put more than $15 billion towards the global COVID-19 response, including donation commitments of over 1.1 billion vaccine doses through COVAX and direct dose sharing. Last month, President Biden's virtual global COVID-19 summit focused on ending the pandemic and building better health security to prevent and prepare for future biological threats worldwide. The summit brought together hundreds of leaders of governments and organizations to work towards shared targets in three critical areas to help end the pandemic. First, vaccinate the world. Second, save lives now. And third, build back better. We are equally committed to establishing a humane, orderly, and fair immigration system in the United States. In addition, we work to promote humane, orderly, and fair forms of migration worldwide through bilateral and multilateral diplomacy, as well as through foreign assistance to targeted capacity building programs to better manage emergencies and crises that displace people. Our assistance helps our international and non-governmental organization partners encourage regular migration, protect human rights, identify and protect, protect refugees and asylum seekers, counter human trafficking and smuggling, and promote opportunities and fair labor practices for migrant workers. We are all well aware that COVID-19 has increased vulnerabilities for many migrants. Countless migrants have lost jobs and returned home only to face continued unemployment and uncertainty. Others were stranded outside their home countries as COVID-19 migration measures locked down borders with no hope for support or livelihoods and at increased risk for exposure to COVID-19, victimization of violence, abuse, and trafficking in persons including gender-based violence and sexual exploitation and abuse. We all need to find ways to manage the legitimate risks of the transmission and spread of COVID-19 consistent with our commitments to safe and humane migration. To that end, the United States is committed to equitable and inclusive access for migrants to COVID-19 vaccinations globally. The US COVID-19 Global Response and Recovery Framework emphasizes these principles as a cornerstone for a successful response strategy. We know much work remains ahead to ensure vaccine delivery is person-centered and that it addresses the real and perceived access barriers faced by migrants. We also know that no nation can manage global challenges like the pandemic and its recovery alone, and that international migration by its very nature involves multiple countries. This is why the United States is committed to international cooperation to ensure a swift and equitable end to COVID-19 so we can all enjoy a healthy and dignified life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have three more speakers. Next in line is Armenia. Hello. Can hear you loud and clear. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Uh, since 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic has been severely affecting the economies and the livelihoods of the states around the world, uh, as well as educational system, transport systems, tourism, agriculture, consumer markets, and all other sectors of our life. However, the impact of COVID on the mobility of people was the most obvious and severe. The world will not be the same, migration will not be the same, are the phrases that are most frequently uttered now by experts and practitioners since the beginning of this pandemic. Uh, 
when the restrictions imposed by states concern the freedom of movement, both domestically within countries and internationally across the borders. Last year was very challenging uh, for Armenia as well, uh, which was conditioned not only by COVID-19 pandemic situation, but also by the war unleashed against Nagorno-Karabakh by Azerbaijan, which threatened not only global peace and security, but also led to a regional humanitarian crisis. The war of aggression unleashed by Azerbaijan was accompanied by large-scale violations of international humanitarian law and international human rights law, war crimes, other mass atrocities. During the hostilities, the armed forces of Azerbaijan deliberately targeted vital civilian infrastructure, peaceful towns and villages, including the densely populated capital of Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh with artillery strikes, air strikes, which have resulted in numerous civilian casualties and destruction. Gross violations of human rights, including in armed conflicts are among multiple and complex factors leading to forced displacement of people. As a result of this aggression of Azerbaijan, about 91,000 people were displaced from their homes and fled to Armenia. 88% of those people were women and children. They had to leave their homes to escape mass atrocities. More than 40,000 people were deprived of their homes, property, vital infrastructure was destroyed, including schools and hospitals. Many of these people have become victims of repeated forced displacement since they had fled ethnic cleansing committed by this country in the early 90s. During the recent aggression, these people were displaced again, while still facing the consequences of the humanitarian crisis, they were double victimized. A year ago, Nagorno-Karabakh war and this forced displacement that posed were at the forefront of international attention. Today, as the new worrying crises have erupted and unfolded, these various, in the various parts of the world, this plight of the displaced people from Artsakh seems to be neglected. These people are deprived of international assistance, protection, and have little prospects for durable solutions. The Armenian government has accommodated the displaced persons in shared accommodations. And due to the current situation with the spread of COVID-19, and the communal shelters are a major health risk for already severely affected population. Uh, Mr. Speaker, despite all these challenges that I have described uh, and that our country faces now, Armenia has provided full access to COVID-19 vaccination to all the displaced population, to all the migrants and refugees residing in our country. Also, from the beginning of the pandemic, government took place to organize the return of some 40,000 of its Armenian nationals, and our embassies and consulates have made an enormous effort in facilitating these processes. In this area, we have extensively cooperated with our international partners, including IOM. Colleagues delivered access to life-saving primary health care services by providing 10,000 consultations to conflict-affected persons through the deployment of two multidisciplinary teams reaching 120 displacement locations all over the country. Referrals to higher level of healthcare and specialized services were provided to more than 3,000 beneficiaries. Furthermore, over 13,000 displaced people were provided with hygiene kits covering four regions of Armenia. Mr. Speaker, in conclusion, I'd like to mention that the Armenian government has done utmost to support displaced and vulnerable populations in times of COVID-19. But in order to succeed in this complicated task, we also count on international solidarity and mutual support. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. Next, also online, is Venezuela. The floor is yours. 
Eh, la crisis del COVID-19 ha puesto de manifiesto las debilidades globales existentes para brindar asistencia y protección a los migrantes en la región de América Latina y el Caribe. Venezuela cuenta con una amplia experiencia en la elaboración y ejecución de políticas socioeconómicas en favor de los migrantes y sus comunidades de acogida. Como una de las prácticas más representativas del gobierno bolivariano en materia de políticas públicas para la migración, resaltamos la eficacia y la coherencia de tales políticas sociales cuyo objetivo es lograr la integración al migrante a la vía nacional, sin realizar distinción entre la condición o estatus migratorio. Todos los ciudadanos residentes en nuestro territorio aprovechan las bondades de las diferentes políticas públicas o misiones sociales, como lo llamamos nosotros, que se realizan en el país y que incluye áreas de salud, educación, vivienda, entre muchas otras, a fin de alcanzar los objetivos de desarrollo del país, reconociendo de esta manera los aportes positivos que se han realizado, que, han realiz que realizan los migrantes en nuestra sociedad. Tan solo en el 2020, más de 300.000 connacionales han regresado a mi país, huyendo de países receptores de la región latinoamericana, que adolecen de eficaces políticas públicas coherentes en materia de protección migratoria. Lamentablemente, en la actualidad, en un contexto mundial caracterizado por una pandemia mundial, algunos gobiernos de la región se niegan a establecer un diálogo con las autoridades de mi país para manejar de manera pragmática y eficaz esta delicada y compleja realidad. Queremos recordar que el retorno voluntario sigue siendo la solución de preferencia duradera para la gestión de la migración. Es primordial que los estados implicados en el problema elaboren un conjunto articulado de acciones que promuevan y faciliten el retorno voluntario en condiciones seguras de la población migrante. Es por esa razón que queremos hacer un llamado a estos países receptores para que permitan que, a través de la Aerolínea Nacional Conviasa, nuestros migrantes puedan regresar al país de una manera segura, ordenada y regular, ya que en algunos países receptores no se le garantiza el acceso a la salud ni a los cuidados relativos a la COVID-19. A pesar de las medidas coercitivas unilaterales impuestas a mi país, las cuales son violatorias de la Carta de las Naciones Unidas, el gobierno bolivariano ha contado con la solidaridad de varios países que han enviado más de 29 millones de dosis de vacunas para cumplir con la meta establecida para la omisión José Gregorio Hernández de vacunar al 70% de la población que vive en el país para el 31 de octubre del año en curso, número que incluye a los migrantes y refugiados que se envían en nuestro país sin distinción alguna. Señor moderador, le, 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 quisiéramos hacerle una pregunta a eh, señor Diego Beltrán. Los informes realizados por la OIM y por la R4B, la Response for Venezuela, sobre Venezuela contienen datos cuestionables desde el punto de vista científico y metodológico que provocan un, que provocan un ser y por consiguiente poca oportunidad en la descripción y en el análisis de los flujos migratorios venezolanos. Quisiéramos saber cuál es la meta que utiliza la OI para verificar el cifra de la migración venezolana en el entendido que esta organización seguía por las cifras que le otorgan otros estados que bien sabemos y como escribí anteriormente están sesgados políticamente. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much and we'll hear from all of our panelists as we close. We have um, Niger next and i think colombia is the last afterwards niger merci monsieur monsieur le moderateur le niger tient à féliciter les panélistes pour la qualité de leur présentation depuis mars 2020 la covid-19 et les restrictions de mouvement qu'elle a entraîné à travers le monde continuent à avoir une incidence sur la mobilité des migrants et le rôle des organisations humanitaires Les migrants qui sont les plus touchés par les conséquences de la COVID-19 peuvent pourtant jouer un rôle important dans la réponse à la COVID-19 en fonction notamment de leurs compétences et de politiques décidées par les États où ils résident. À cet égard, le Niger ne peut s'empêcher de répéter l'importance de l'inclusion des migrants dans les politiques de préparation et de riposte à la COVID-19. Comme l'a si bien dit le secrétaire général des Nations Unies, Personne n'est à l'abri tant que tous ne le sont pas. Dans cette optique, le Niger réitère son appel à l'endroit des autres membres de la communauté internationale en vue d'une action rapide en vue de l'acquisition par le plus grand nombre d'États des capacités de production des vaccins et de la facilitation de leur accès par le plus grand nombre possible de populations. Cela participe de la mise en œuvre du partenariat mondial renouvelé 
dont nous nous sommes tous convenus dans le programme du développement durable pour l'horizon 2030, afin de ne laisser personne à la traîne et d'atteindre les objectifs de développement durable fixés. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. Colombia, the floor is yours. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, queremos agradecer a los panelistas por sus intervenciones. A pesar de los desproporcionados efectos de la pandemia del COVID-19 en nuestro país, y como ya lo mencionó el enviado especial del director general de la OIM, el gobierno del presidente Iván Duque dio un paso histórico con la adopción del Estatuto Temporal de Protección para Migrantes Venezolanos, el cual beneficiará a la totalidad de ciudadanos venezolanos con vocación de permanencia que se encontraban en Colombia a enero de 2021, es decir, 1.7 millones de personas. El estatuto permitirá como primer pilar un mejor acceso al trabajo, a los servicios del Estado y a todos los derechos políticos, económicos y sociales. En el primer pilar de acceso está la inclusión de los migrantes en los planes de vacunación contra el COVID-19, que desde un punto de vista ético y de derechos humanos debe incluir a los migrantes tanto regulares como irregulares. El estatuto nos permitirá aumentar la población regularizada y por lo tanto facilitar la logística para su vacunación. El segundo pilar de nuestra política es la integración con equidad, el, la cual permitirá pasar de la fase de asistencia humanitaria a la estabilización de proyectos de vida en el mediano y largo plazo. Promovemos la empleabilidad de los migrantes mediante la convalidación de títulos, la capacitación para el trabajo, la inclusión financiera y las iniciativas de acompañamiento en sus emprendimientos. El estatuto ha sido una prioridad del gobierno colombiano a tal punto que, luego de los avances en su implementación en el día de ayer, el propio presidente Duque hizo entrega del primer documento expedido en beneficio de un ciudadano venezolano en nuestro país. Ya hemos finalizado el registro biométrico de más de un millón de ciudadanos venezolanos. Visibilizar a una comunidad vulnerable y golpeada por la crisis multidimensional de Venezuela, pero también por los efectos de la pandemia en nuestra economía, es la mejor política para incluirlos y para luchar contra la xenofobia y la discriminación. El apoyo de la comunidad internacional en la respuesta a la migración venezolana ha sido fundamental. Es una cooperación que es urgente por la dimensión del fenómeno y más en el contexto de la pandemia que ha impactado la salud y la economía de todos. Eh, los planes regionales de respuesta, como también fue mencionado bajo liderazgo de la OIM y del ACNUR, son una herramienta central para asegurar coordinación y eficacia en esta cooperación. A nivel nacional, el grupo interagencial que se creó a partir del plan nos ha permitido coordinar la acción de más de 159 socios organizaciones, cooperantes y donantes. Eh, estos recursos se ejecutan a través de los propios donantes, los organismos internacionales y las organizaciones afines. En las conferencias de donantes realizadas es necesario distinguir entre anuncios, desembolsos, donaciones y créditos. Por esto, a pesar del inmenso apoyo recibido, sigue siendo una crisis que tiene una respuesta limitada y subfinanciada. Buena parte de la asistencia depende de la capacidad fiscal de los países de acogida, de las autoridades locales y de las comunidades de acogida. Para el año 2021, únicamente un 50% de los recursos inicialmente solicitados por Colombia han sido comprometidos. Reiteramos, por tanto, la necesidad de movilizar mayor atención y apoyo a la comunidad internacional para atender esta crisis que permanece. Nuestra pregunta para los panelistas es cómo asegurar en el contexto de la pandemia del COVID-19 que aún no finaliza, una cooperación internacional, una financiación innovadora y predecible para atender a los enormes desafíos que enfrentamos en el proceso de acoger a los flujos migratorios mixtos provenientes de Venezuela. Muchas gracias. Thank you. We will now go to our panelists to very briefly give a few last words and address any questions we were put towards them. Let's go to Special Envoy Diego Beltran. Diego, floor is yours. Muchísimas gracias, Jeff. Muchas gracias a 
los, a, a quienes han hecho intervenciones y preguntas y particularmente en mi caso a las delegaciones honorables delegaciones de Ecuador, Colombia y Venezuela. Eh, a todos agradezco sus comentarios y quisiera dirigirme a enfocarme en responder a las dos preguntas que se han hecho eh, a la honorable misión de, de la República Bolivariana de Venezuela eh, mencionar que las estadísticas que desde la plataforma interagencial al 4 b eh, se publican son efectivamente eh, compilaciones y análisis de las estadísticas oficiales de eh, los países receptores que naturalmente no, no solo reciben eh, ciudadanos venezolanos o venezolanas, sino también de otras nacionalidades y recientemente ha habido incrementos en la, en la recepción de migrantes extracontinentales eh, y otras nacionalidades interregionales. De tal manera que para todos los efectos eh, tomamos estas estadísticas de manera eh, confiable y hacemos nuestros propios análisis que incluyen estimaciones y mecanismos complementarios eh, de proyección, eh, excluyendo poblaciones retornadas, por ejemplo, como mencionó el delegado de la República Bolivariana de Venezuela, y eh, no todos los países registran incrementos, sino que algunos registran algún decrecimiento, de tal manera que se trata de actualizar permanentemente esta información. Para no, no digamos, establecer un, eh, un, una respuesta muy técnica, eh, sí mencionaría que eh, dentro de estas eh, estadísticas eh, hay un grupo de trabajo, tanto del ACNUR, de la OIM, técnico de oficiales de gestión de la información, que están a disposición de eh, la Honorable Misión Permanente de la República Bolivariana de Venezuela, así como de todas las otras eh, gobiernos receptores para eh, poder conversar sobre las metodologías técnicas de eh, compilación, análisis y presentación de las estadísticas sobre eh, flujos mixtos eh, de población venezolana. Eh, en ese sentido estamos completamente a disposición. Eh, respecto a la pregunta realizada por la honorable emisión de Colombia, eh, quisiera, bueno, de alguna manera ya hice referencia anteriormente a los esfuerzos que se han venido haciendo con tres conferencias de donantes, eh, la primera organizada por la Unión Europea más en solidaridad y luego otras dos con compromisos financieros, eh, compromisos financieros que se van haciendo efectivos y eh, apoyan a complementar los esfuerzos de eh, los gobiernos receptores, eh, la formación de grupos amigos, en, en definitiva la mejor utilización y coordinación con la cooperación internacional, entre la cooperación internacional y los gobiernos receptores, asegurar un flujo más sostenible. Eh, en, en ese sentido, lo que hacemos es animar a continuar con los procesos de conferencia de donantes y poder desarrollar de esta manera eh, un seguimiento efectivo al cumplimiento de esos compromisos eh, financieros. Eh, finalmente, quisiera terminar diciendo que ante esta situación inesperada de pandemia de la que nadie estaba preparado, eh, el, es una gran oportunidad para un mayor diálogo entre los gobiernos, como se ha venido haciendo en buena medida, para aplicar la Agenda 2030, los pactos globales, y encontrar más vías de migración segura, regular y ordenada. Por último, el combate a la xenofobia, el apoyo a los grupos vulnerables son elementos esenciales de la respuesta específicamente a estos flujos mixtos, pero naturalmente en cualquier región y en cualquier situación en el mundo. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Diego. Um, Dr. Christian Mulamba, can we go to you for your final intervention? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, my final intervention will be uh, in advocacy for considering, as I said, the vulnerable situation in which the person in displacement go through a regular crisis and each um, additional crisis or stress above that, it's uh, very difficult for them to hold in, uh, um, resources and support is not there. So um, coming back 
what was stressed, always uh, advocating for them to be considered the planning phases as people who should be benefiting for any support as for the fourth community. Uh, the question of the resources is one of uh, the critical one and uh, through the experience we went through uh, with the United Nations, IOM and the SURF funding, I will be advocating for more flexible funding where we can have contributing countries nations, but also multilateral, bilateral donors to meet and come together with a very flexible funding mechanism where we can quickly have access to some program development money, but that white facing emergency which is resources. So more flexible uh, funding instruments will be what we like that very much of time, battle can be won and lost, but the first responder and the country organized to tackle the challenge. Thank you very much. That's very well heard. Um, Seda Guntai, your last words, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was really uh, very interesting for me again to understand uh, the problems, needs are almost the same, uh, but the contexts are very different. So it was a, a good opportunity for me to listen the, from the countries who has the, lar has the large uh, population of migrants. Thank you very much for organizing this. Uh, for my last words, I think as humanitarian actors, actors we need to uh, develop long-term scenarios. We are uh, not bad in short-term planning uh, concerning with the COVID, uh, but we still uh, do, not, do not have concrete planned scenarios for the long-term. Uh, there are some efforts in humanitarian aid sector, uh, but I see uh, there are more efforts in uh, other sectors, uh, private sector ex especially, so uh, we need to engage the efforts for long-term planning, especially the evidence-based forecasting for the, what the new normal is. We are all expecting to go back to our normals, but we all know that the new normal will be very different. Uh, if the COVID ends, uh, it will end one day, uh, but the new normal will not be the same as we already examined before the COVID. Uh, especially the socioeconomic uh, impact of the COVID uh, shows us that uh, the uh, definitions that we uh, made already for the livelihood, socioeconomic empowerment will obviously change. Entrepreneurship is important, employability is important to uh, intervene the impacts of uh, this crisis, but it's a fact that the uh, job market is shrinking and entrepreneurship, the success of entrepreneurship has not been uh, identified yet uh, not enough uh, to uh, create new jobs to uh, sustain uh, the livelihoods of the vulnerable. So we have to work together and share knowledge as best practices more a concrete way and uh, to separate this knowledge uh, to all countries that uh, have the uh, same problems and uh, same all of us have uh, the same needs. Uh, and also for the funding, uh, we need to uh, retain new forms of fundings. Uh, one uh, important thing is flexible funding is really important. COVID shows us uh, this also. Uh, project fundings are uh, much more uh, unflexible, so we have to create new flexible funding opportunities. And uh, we believe that uh, engaging private sectors and uh, creating green, new resources uh, is uh, will be uh, very important uh, for the uh, future interventions. Uh, I want to thank you all of you very much. Uh, it was really a good opportunity for me to listen your experiences and uh, your uh, uh, interventions. Uh, it was really fruitful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Secretary Mosin, final word is yours. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, you know, for organizing this kind of very important uh, discussion of the 
webinar. Uh, I just want to mention a few words that our government provided enough masks, PPEs to the people to stop spreading the COVID-19, uh, including the forcefully displaced Myanmar nationals. And uh, monitoring teams work uh, during the COVID situation to ensure social uh, distancing and uh, even the health rules. Especially the frontline fighters, doctors and nurses and volunteers are facilitated with some financial and other benefits in order to motivate uh, them. And then the government motto or the views was live and livelihood. This was the model. We must emphasis to save the life as well as to continue the uh, to continue the livelihood. And uh, one information for you, I think many of you surprised that during uh, Cyclone Ampan, you know, we have evacuated 2.4 million people to the shelters, you know, during the Ampan, maintaining social distancing and health roles. And they stayed in the shelters uh, two days. And the volunteers uh, send the food and relief to the doorsteps to the distressed people when they call the national hotline 33 and the three. And again, I want to mention the government has to put a continuous effort uh, in, the, in the regards of the Myanmar nationals, they are staying in our country. Uh, and I need to mention that the government keeps supporting the forcefully displaced Myanmar nationals people, but I would like to get the attention of global community for their repatriation. And repatriation is only one goal. And Bangladesh has been uh, compassionate to the Rohingya people from day one. I hope the developed nations will keep supporting us to the more helpful. So with these few words, I want to conclude my remarks. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, sir. If, if I was gonna summarize, I'd say that three things. What are the three biggest lessons learned? We need to incorporate planning based on these lessons learned, based on inclusion of refugees and displaced populations, and making sure there is equitable accessibility to PPP, PPE as well as vaccines um, associated with COVID. This, those have been overarching themes. I'd like to thank the panel for joining us today to, for such a fruitful discussion. Crisis response, involves a lot of hands-on problem solving. So it's always interesting to get experienced people around the table to share lessons learned and give us fresh ideas for moving forward. This is especially important during times like COVID-19 when there are so many uncertainties and things change considerably at a moment's notice. Our goal here wasn't just to share information, but rather to gain deeper understanding and insights into on the ground realities to help us come up with more effective ways to support migrants and IDPs live a life of dignity. I hope you've gotten as much out of the discussion as I have. And I'd like to say a big thank you again to the panelists and to all the participants who took the time to join us here today. Thank you. Thank you all, and we are resuming uh, tomorrow on 10 a.m. for those in person here in the very same room, for those online through Zoom as today. Thank you all. Thank you, and see you tomorrow. Thank you.